Good evening. How's everyone doing? Awesome. So glad to be back. Um, which, by the way, we, well, we'll talk about that later, what we're doing after this. But um, let's just pray. Did everybody have a good day? Yeah. Kind of crazy day, some of you. I had good and crazy kind of mixed in. So let's just pray and kind of get our minds in the right place. God, we thank you for just being able to come together tonight with other women and talk about your word and talk about who you are and what you're doing in our lives. I pray that as we dig into the Bible tonight, we would learn more about you, God. We would understand more of what you're calling us to, God, and, and we would feel your presence here tonight as we discuss what we're hearing, God. And I just pray you'd bless us tonight and bless these ladies in Jesus' name. Amen. So tonight we're talking about Jesus happened, and I kind of alluded to this last week when we ended on um, Jesus and women, that Jesus is the answer, Jesus does what we think we need to do on our own, what we think man needs to do, he does, he happens, and we'll never be the same. So I figured this might be a great place to start tonight with um, talking about Jesus taking his disciples this was in the last um, winter or, or season before he went to the cross. And um, uh, so we're going to start there. This is a photo of Caesarea Philippi. And um, this is a place that was dedicated to the god of Pan. Um, the half, this was a half man, half goat god. Weird stuff that people would worship. Um, basically, the god of fright where the word panic comes from. So if you, that gives you kind of a picture of where these people's heads were, what they were worshiping. Um, the people who lived here believed that their city was located at the gate of the underworld or the gate of Hades, and that the gods that they worshiped, mainly the gods of fertility, fertility gods, went to the underworld in the winter and returned to them in the spring. This was like, so when Jesus takes his disciples here, it was like taking them to the red light district. Because you can, I'm just going to let you use your imagination of all kinds of perverse things that they were doing to worship these gods, to try to entice them out from the underworld that they imagined they went into. So this big cave here is what they call the gates of Hades. That was the, the, um, what they, you know, in, what, where they felt like that was their connection to the underworld. There was a, a river that came out of it. So there's all kinds of other stuff that goes along with um, why they believe this was their, the entrance into the underworld and their city was, was, sl was right there. Um, so basically Jesus takes them, the disciples, to this spot and gives them kind of a graduation speech. Like, hey guys going to give you what it takes to go out there into the world. And we're going to talk about in th that in a minute. So the second slide is what it would have looked like in the first century when Jesus took his disciples there. So this is just like a painting rendition of what, um, what it would have looked like. So let's start in Matthew 16, verse 13. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied to him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys, to the king, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, which whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. So there's a lot going on here. I have, I don't know about you, but I have read this passage so many times, and I had no idea that this is where they were standing. 
Like, I just did not connect with. The gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Like, okay, well, that means I'm just trying to imagine what that means. How does that apply to my life? How does that, and what we're seeing here is he, Jesus always taught with where he, what he was seeing. When he was talking about sheep and the sheep gate and the sheep fold, he was walking by these things. When he was talking about, I'm the vine, he was probably walking by a vineyard. When he was talking about, um, you will say to this mountain and it will move and it will be thrown into the sea, he was looking at a man-made mountain that sat right next to the Dead Sea. So when Jesus, all these things that Jesus uses as pictures to teach his disciples and his followers, he's, he's near. So, of course, when we, talk about Cesar, when we talk about the gates of, I'm going to build my church on this rock, he has a visual to show them because that's how he taught them for three years. Jesus was saying to his disciples, don't hide from evil. Don't try to hide. Don't be afraid of it. He was leading them by example because he was going into, right into the place where every Jew would have avoided. Seeing things that every Jewish person would have run away from because of the practices that these people were, were doing. Um, he was leading them by examples. And basically, these disciples had studied under their rabbi... Jesus was their rabbi. He was their teacher. We talked about that a little bit last week about how the rabbis would debate scripture. This is what I feel like God is saying. This is what I feel like God is saying. This is what I feel like God is saying. You know, this is what I see, how I see it. People would come to them and ask them, what does this mean? And the rabbi would interpret, how does this apply to your life? And they would go away and do it. So the disciples had studied under their rabbi for several years, and now he was commissioning them to, a huge, to, to do a huge task. He was saying, attack evil and build the church on the very places that are filled with the most corruption. How many of you were here this past weekend? <laughs> if you did not hear or watch the message on Babylon, you need to go home and put it on your, in your phone right now. Reminder, I need to go watch that. Because we're talking about how to live in a modern day Babylon, which is basically what Jesus was saying to his disciples. Don't be afraid of evil. I want you to go build a church right on top of what the enemy is trying to do. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So when Jesus, when I, when I talk about, when I was talking about the rabbis last week and even now where, you know, someone would come to the rabbi and they would give them, they would say, what do I do here? What does this mean? Jesus makes Peter a rabbi in that passage that we just read. He says, whatever is, Peter, on you, I'm going to build my church. On this rock, Peter, you're the rock. On this rock, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Whatever you bind on, heaven, uh, on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. He is making Peter a rabbi. He's saying, I'm passing my mantle on to you. Go do these things. And so when we look at that, you know, I, I read that, have read that verse so many times. I didn't really understand binding and loosing. What does that mean? Well, those are your words. Your words are binding. So when a rabbi in those, in those days, and even now, they act as a judge. They're helping the Jewish people figure out how to apply the written law. What does this mean for me today? The word, what, is this, what does the word of God mean? mean in my life. They were looked at with authority and whatever they said was binding. The only person that could release you from a rabbi's binding word was that rabbi. Okay? So in Matthew, here's an example of this. In Matthew chapter 19, has anyone heard of the rich young ruler? He goes to Jesus and says, Jesus, what do I need to do to have eternal life? And Jesus said, you need to follow these commandments. And he lists the commandments. And he's like, I've already done that. What, do I, what else do I have to do? And Jesus says, 
If you want to be perfect, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. Then come, follow me. That's verse 21. Very next verse, 22 says, But when the man heard this, he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Why was he sad? Because he had to do it. He went to the rabbi and said, what do I do? And the rabbi told him what to do. So he walked away. He's a good Jewish man. I've got to do it. His words were binding. So basically, Jesus promoted. So back to the, back to the stories in Caesarea Philippi. That was just a little bunny trail that kind of key. Um, He promotes, Jesus promotes Peter and charges all the disciples to carry on. And he does this even knowing what's coming. You know, one of the things that when we talked in in Israel, when we were being taught, I did not, I thought the disciples knew all along what was going to happen to Jesus. They did not. Even now, they still do not understand what is, uh, what is ahead for Jesus? They are thinking, he's coming, the Messiah is here, we've been waiting for the Messiah all these years, we've heard about him, we've seen the prophecies, we've read the prophecies, we've been waiting and watching and looking for the Messiah, the Savior to come and save us from, and in their minds, they're thinking, Rome. They're thinking this, the Messiah is coming to save us from the Roman Empire. So that he's going to build an earthly kingdom and overthrow the Roman Empire and we will all be saved. Jesus comes to save us from way more than the Roman Empire. Amen? Amen. He comes to save us from our sin. He comes to save us from ourself, and they do not get it. Even walking with him, learning from him for three years, they still don't get it. Right until the very end, they, they finally get it. They're like, oh, and we're going to talk about that next week when we talk about Judas. But So we're kind of skipping ahead a little bit. So in John chapter 13, um, Jesus is having an interaction. He's just washed the disciples' feet. He's getting ready to go to the cross. And Simon Peter asks him, Lord, where are you going? Because Jesus is talking about, I'm going to a place. I'm going to go prepare a place for you. And I tried to break, like, give you just the minimum scripture that I could because there's just so much. But I encourage you, go home and read all of these passages. Read the whole chapter. Read before that chapter. There's so much more here that you can learn from, but again, I'm trying to condense it so that I can give you a picture of where we're going. So, so Simon Peter says, well, where are you going? And Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow, but you will follow later. And Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Uh, this is Peter talking. I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? I love this. I just love this. Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter is like, I'm going to show you, Jesus, how much I'm committed to you. You made me a rabbi. You commissioned us. I got this. I'm going to go. We're going to do it. I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus is like, I know you better than you know yourself, dude. You are going to deny me at the first chance you get. You will say, I do not know him. And, that's ex- and go read it, because I can't read it to you tonight. So go read it. Peter is just like, I, 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 I'm, I'm your guy. I will do anything, God. I will do anything, Jesus. I will do whatever it takes and show you how committed I am to you. And Jesus says, I know you better, and I love you anyway. I love you still. I'm not going to hold it against you. I'm not going to beat you up for it. I'm not going to say, I told you so. I knew you'd do that. I mean, can you imagine, Jesus, all this plays out exactly as Jesus says, and then he appears to his disciples once he is raised from the dead, 
And I mean, the, the first thing out of his mouth is not, I, tell, I knew you'd do that, you jerk. <laughs> he knows us and he loves us. How much, I mean, I hold things against myself all the time and things against other people. I'm like, God, help me to not be that judge. Can you imagine arguing with Jesus? <laughs> Peter's like, no, God, I'm not, Lord, I'm not going to do that. And he's like, oh, yeah, you will. I mean, and then I think about how many times I've argued with God. I know none of y'all have ever done that, probably. <laughs> so this interaction is a good example of even though they have walked with Jesus for three years, they still do not know what's coming. He has told them, and they don't understand it. They don't get it. They were still looking for him to do what they thought he would do. I don't know if you can relate to any of that. I can. I'm still looking for Jesus to do what I think he should do. And he's like, I have something bigger, Kristen, that you're not even dreaming of. Because you just are stuck on this thing. And they were so stuck on a Messiah that would come and save them from Rome. A Messiah that would come and save them from the tension that we live in today. A Messiah that would come and save us from whatever you fill in the blank. Whatever your opinion is about what's going on in society. And Jesus is like, I got so much more for all of us. So Peter's trying to convince Jesus that he would die for him, and Jesus is saying, oh, buddy, I'm about to die for all of you. And it's going to mean way more than your death. It's going to change everything forever. So now we're going to skip ahead again. So after Jesus dies and he is raised from the dead, the disciples are fishing at the Sea of Galilee and he appears to them on the shore. He's already, they've already seen him. They've seen his hands. They've, they've interacted with him. Um, but he appears to them again on the, sea, on the shore of Galilee. And in this spot is where we have this teaching in Israel. And when we turned around after, and, then, and the teaching that we're going to hear next week about Judas... And we turned around, and there were fish and loaves cooking on this little campfire for us to eat where this happened. Can you imagine? Like, it was, blew my mind. I was like, wow. I mean, you could, it was whole fish, because that's what they did. <laughs> and it wasn't like fillets. It's like the little eyeballs looking at you. Um, but it was the best fish and bread I've ever had, because it was just so real. It made this so real. So... Anyway, so they, Peter jumps into the water when he sees Jesus. He's like, I'm not waiting for us to get to the shore. You know, Jesus tells him, throw your net on the other side. You'll catch something. They realize it's Jesus. He jumps in, gets to the shore before everyone else. And Jesus says in John 21, now come and have some breakfast. So Jesus cooks them breakfast. He washes their feet. He cooks them breakfast. I can learn some things from Jesus. Um, None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew he was the Lord. Then Jesus served them the bread and the fish. This was the third time he had appeared to his disciples since he had been raised from the dead. And after breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter. <laughs> Remember when he said, who do, you think I, who do you say I am? Back at Caesarea Philippi, back at the gates of Hades. He says, um, ask Simon, where was I? After breast, he asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. Remember, I will die for you. I love this. It's so me. <laughs> then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. And then Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said. You know I love you. Then take care of my sheep. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus had asked him a question a third time. Yes, Lord, I love you. You know I love you. You know everything. Then feed my sheep. Why does Jesus ask him three times? 
because he denied him three times. Nothing is random. So Jesus sees more in Peter than Peter sees in himself. And Jesus knew that Peter would probably not be able to get over him denying Jesus three times on his own. Anything we're struggling getting over on our own? We need Jesus. He is the answer. He comes to Peter, singles him out, and leads him into repentance. He does all the work of repentance. He sets the table. He asks the questions that we need him to ask us so that we are fully repented to him. That's why, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Jesus comes and he reverses the curse that we speak with our own words. Peter denied Jesus three times and basically cursed himself and what he was called to do with his own words. It says the power of life is in, is in the tongue, death or life. You choose what you speak in Proverbs. Blessings and cursings coming out of the same well. We can't, we can't reverse it on our own. And Jesus comes to Peter and he leads him into repentance. He made Peter's words, I will die for you, true. He would not have died for him because he denied him. But he saw what was in Peter's heart. He saw what was going on inside him, what he really wanted to be able to do but he couldn't do on his own. And Jesus comes in and he brings him to repentance and he makes those words true because he did die for him. Isn't that amazing? When we declare who Jesus is, he declares who we are. He asked Peter back in... Caesarea Philippi, who do you say I am? And Peter said, you are the Messiah, you are the Son of God. And then Jesus proceeds to tell Peter who he is. You are the rock that I'm going to build my church on, and the gates of Hades will not prevail, and whatever you bind will be bound, and whatever you loose will be loosed. He spoke into Peter identity that Peter did not have. When we declare, Jesus, you are the Messiah, you are the Son of God, I want to live for you, I will die for you, he tells us who we are in him. It starts with us saying, this is who you are, Jesus. And then he says, okay, Kristen, okay, Ashley, okay, Kendall, okay, Michelle, this is who you are. And this is what I'm going to do in you. And you will never be the same. And the gates of hell will not prevail. So don't be afraid of evil and don't be afraid of the world. Go out there and do what I have commissioned you to do. Because I'm the one that declares who you are. What is God saying about you? And where is he sending you? He has something new for us every day. He has something new to walk in every day. If we get to a place where we say, I figured it out, I know how to do this Christian thing, I get up in the morning, I read my Bible, I have my worship time, I go to work, I go home, I make my dinner, I take care of my family, I just... I mean, we talked about last week how God had amazing adventures in the Bible for us to join up, them to join up with. I want that. Do you? I want that. Peter inspires me. 
He listened to God when it says back in Matthew where he, when Jesus said, Peter, or Peter said to Jesus, you are the Messiah, you are the Son of God. It's, he says, Jesus, Peter, Jesus says to Peter, sorry, my head's working too fast. <laughs> Jesus says to Peter, you did not get this on your own. You did not figure out who I am on your own. You got this from my Father in heaven. We listen and we follow. That's the example we have in Peter. He listened and he followed. Did he do it perfectly? Nope. Will we do it perfectly? Nope. But we can count on he will be there to lead us back so that our words and the, and the things that we want to be true about us are true. I want to follow you with all my heart, God. I want to stop this and do this. I want to listen to you better. He will make those things true. When we put our hands up in worship and we sing those songs, he will make them true. Not bending us over, not against our will, but he will make them true. Let's pray. Jesus, we're so grateful that you have just given us such a great example of what you have taken in Peter, what you see in Peter, God, what you brought him through, what you, how you restored him back to you. I'm so grateful that we get to open up the Bible and learn this tonight. And I pray, God, that as we talk about where we're at with you, Lord, we would all come to that place of what do, who do we say you are? Who do we say Jesus is? I pray, Lord, that when we need to receive from you who you say we are, we would be listening. We would not be afraid of the evil that we see in the world. We would not be afraid of the evil that we see pressing right up against us. We would trust you. We would know that you have equipped us and that you will overcome through us. I pray for these ladies tonight. I pray for the discussion at their tables. I pray that as they leave here tonight, they would go with more of who you are, in empowering them and identifying them. I pray you bless them tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, ladies.